Well, I uh, started my academic career in chemistry and um, at some point uh, found that I wanted to ask larger questions than I was able to do within a uh, intensive research program. So I decided that I would switch fields and uh, get a PhD in English instead of chemistry. And after I got my PhD in literary studies, I then decided that I would uh, reopen my scientific training and try to find ways to talk about literature and science. And at the time, the field of liter uh, literature and science hardly existed. It was really in very rudimentary form. So I was tasked with the, uh, with the uh, necessity to basically in try to invent procedures for this interdisciplinary field from scratch. Uh, and at the, about that time, uh, science technology studies were taking off. That was a great help to me because it provided a lot of uh, protocols for how you could carry on this kind of investigation. And I felt that the influence studies, which were predominant at that time in literature and science studies, were far too limited to account for what was actually happening. I felt that, uh, yes, science was culturally influenced, but in indirect ways because uh, both scientists and literary artists were asking the same kind of questions at the same time but influenced by very different ways to express them. So I felt the, that you had to go to the, the, the root of these kinds of uh, intersections, which for me was culture. So uh, the task then was to try to find ways to talk about the cultural influences uh, in non-reductive ways. My uh, early training in a scientific field gave me a good sense of how important the materiality of objects is. So there's basically two ways you can read a book. One way is to just immediately decode all the symbols in your mind as you read. Uh, and in that case, uh, the book becomes more or less a transparent vessel. Uh, you're simply picking up the ideas that the author put there and you're processing them in your own way. But a very different way to read a book is to pay attention to the texture of the page, the exact shade of the ink, the kind of font that's being used. And in that case, you're combining your understanding of the signifiers with uh, intense attention to its material form. Paying attention to the medium also carried over for me into digital compositions as well. So it is often said that uh, digital creations are immaterial. Well, nothing could be further than the truth. They are always material. They're always located in specific kinds of hardware and software. And just as you can pay attention to the materiality of the page, you can also pay attention to the materiality of digital code which is a, a, a very analogous, I think, to reading the page as, as a material surface. So then I got interested in the idea that you could have material metaphors. So the usual sense of a metaphor is that you're analogizing one kind of poetic expression with another kind of poetic expression. Uh, but in a material metaphor, it's the material form itself which functions uh, to allude to some other kind of structure. One of the classes of material metaphors I explored were, was the skewomorph. And a skewomorph is a design motif in a material object that has ceased to be functional, but refers back to an earlier time when it was functional. So all skewomorphs are material metaphors. They're objects that refer back to earlier practices as a kind of uh, cultural nostalgia. Uh, what's perhaps my best known book, How We Became Post-Human, I tried to make it clear that in my view, the human is a historical construction. There is a certain biological continuity between the earliest species we classify as uh, human 
and present-day humans, but there are also enormous changes that have gone along with changing environments and changing cultural conditions. So if we accept the idea that what counts as human is under continuous construction, one of the most powerful forces in our environment changing what it means to be human are technologies. And in the post-human book, I tried to argue that a certain constellation of what counted as human that was formed in the Enlightenment uh, was currently being radically reconfigured by these new technologies. So the technologies I was looking at were things like virtual re reality, biotics, uh, digital computation, and so forth. And I was arguing that what the Enlightenment thought was human was uh, a self-contained, autonomous individual who was rational, capable of higher thought than other species, and autonomous and self-contained. I tried to show in some detail how this idea of the autonomous, self-contained individual simply didn't hold water in the contemporary period because humans were engaged in building a whole infrastructure of computational media that, uh, with whom they had entered into a deep symbiosis. So symbiosis in biology simply means two species who live close together and share their lives. But for humans, this meant not another biological species, but rather our technologies, such as the internet, such as robotics, uh, such as computational media in all its forms. And as we enter deeper into symbiosis with technical media, uh, our own vision of ourselves was changing as well as the environments in which we live. Posthumanism has now become a, a rather large area of critical studies. Many people uh, take that label and put their own spin on it in various kinds of ways. Um, and I think that's, that's fine. Uh, but I myself uh, think that what really is needed is a more comprehensive view of cognition. So cognition to me means that an organism receives information from the environment, processes and interprets that information, and then engages in some kind of behavior relative to that. So the, the crucial point here for me is that there is an interpretive phase. And I argue that all biological organisms possess cognitive capabilities because they receive information, they interpret that information according to their own individual histories and species evolutionary histories, and they engage in appropriate behaviors. So animals do engage in behaviors that function as signs. They're not verbal signs. They're not abstract signs such as humans use, but they're signs. And once you uh, admit that animals do engage in sign behaviors, then what you've done is open the whole realm of meaning making to animals. Because it's not only humans who, who engage in meaning making practices, all biological organisms engage in meaning-making practices in the sense that they perform behaviors which function as signs and therefore gives them access to the future, to anticipation, and uh, to realms of meaning-making they wouldn't have if they didn't engage in sign behaviors. Part of my fascination with AI in the form of large language models is my astonishment that we now have machines which can talk to us in our own language. And within the field of AI, there's a huge debate at present on how we should interpret these messages from ChatGPT, for example. Uh, and there are those who argue that their messages are merely probabilistic sequences that have no meaning other than those we project onto them. My own position, which is currently a minority view is that these uh, artificial intelligences uh, have created billions and billions of correlations from the human authored text that they've read. 
And moreover, they form networks between these correlations, and then they have inferred, uh, made inferences as a result of these networks. So looking at their architecture, I think we can discern a way in which uh, they are capable of emergent meaning construction. So I recognize that these machines are, are not human. They are not embodied in the usual sense, although they have material bodies, they must have material bodies to exist in the world, but they don't have our kinds of embodied experiences. So there's a certain fragility in how they understand the world. They don't have a model of the world. They only have a model of language. Even more specifically, they don't have a model of language. They only have a model of language use. That is, uh, how humans have used language in the centuries that humans have been producing texts. So um, this is a tremendously exciting field from my point of view. I never thought during my lifetime AI would advance to the point where it could write poems and create plays and uh, perform uh, these amazing linguistic tasks, uh, which they currently do. Uh, and it's very difficult I think now to say where this research is going to end. Uh, there are a lot of risks in creating machines this intelligent that obviously have uh, deep cognitive abilities, not only with language, but writing computer code, interpreting music, looking at images. So their cognitive activities span a whole uh, variety of different domains. And uh, in some ways, they may be more useful for writing code than writing language because code is very formulaic and it lends itself to precise interpretation of the terms. Whereas, of course, language is notoriously uh, ambiguous in many, in many ways. So all this is fascinating to, to me and I'm really interested to see wh where it's going.